Uh, you know, I'm excited about today's uh, lesson, I, lesson, whatever, I guess time in the Word, whatever you want to call it. You know, I, we, we finished up uh, Ecclesiastes last week. We got to the end and saw the end from the beginning. We've been shown that all things, right, that are built for finding purpose and meaning in something of this world is ultimately what? Hevel. It's ultimately futile. We've seen that life is best living with the end in mind, living life in light of death, and living our life backwards from the understanding of death that all things, all things will come to an end, and we live in light of that backwards to see the truth. And we've seen that our chief end, our chief focus is to what? Fear God and keep His commandments. We've been spending eight weeks looking backwards, but now I want to take a week, and, and this is probably, I mean, I, honestly, this is probably my favorite passage in all of Scripture. I love the passion. I love the focus. I love what is called for here. As we begin to look forward in, in coming out of Ecclesiastes and looking over and over to understand all of these things that we've been grasping for that have left us with futility, that now there can maybe be something that is different. Looking forward to a life with our understanding properly fixed. And we look first for salvation, not in, looking last week, not in the things that we can grasp for, but in a Savior who knew that the way to save us and to bring us to the God that we had lost a fellowship with was to do what? Was to not grasp but to trust fully in the God who would lead him, interestingly, to lose everything. To become a slave. To die. Trusting that God would be with him through it all in order that in his death he might defeat the enemy that we all face, which is what? The grave. And that in his obedience he was crowned with glory and with honor as the true king of over all of creation, right? And that we, by trusting our king, he would bring us to salvation and a promise that one day that we would be resurrected with him as well. We saw that in Philippians chapter 2. In Jesus, we see the gospel. In Jesus, we see the only good news in this world under the sun. And so for eight weeks, I've told you over and over that grasping after something is futile. You've heard me say for eight weeks, grasping is futile. Whether it be meaning, whether it be power, whether it be, as Jared shared with us, wisdom, whether it be time, whether it be immortality, whether it be control, whatever it is, grasping in this life will ultimately lead to futility. But today, I want to show you one thing to grasp after. In our finishing up of Ecclesiastes, one thing that truly to grasp after, and I pray that it blesses you. You know, in, in Philippians chapter 3, it's like the Apostle Paul, he's speaking very similarly, and I think you'll see it, like Solomon did in Ecclesiastes, but he gives us yet another step. He gives us even yet another step that the author that came along, the, the frame narrator, didn't give us. The one that makes all of the difference. And so we're going to look at Philippians chapter 3. And this is going to be less of a, probably a breaking it down sermon and more just kind of a walking through it. I just want to share with you my heart in this passage and why this passage is so dear to me. And just seeing what is it that lead in this life that's truly not futile. There is but one thing that to grasp for that will lead us to fulfillment. So he starts off in, in Philippians chapter 3. If you have your Bible, and I encourage you, honestly, I do encourage you. I know the thing is to be in one of these or one of our phones. I encourage you, as your pastor... I encourage you to bring a Bible with you. That's not a law. That's not a you must. That's not a if you can't read it. I, I get it. There's reasons. But bring your Bible. Get a Bible you can be in, that you can remember. I think it's important. That's not a, I don't, don't take that. Nobody take that as a, a con condemnation. Please don't. Don't send me an email later. That's not what I mean. 
But I think there is beauty in that. Let, let's be a people. I think we should bring our Bibles, be in them. I think it's important that we grow in that. Anyway, side note, I want to get into Philippians chapter 3. And Paul, in the first three, cha- first three verses, he's going to kind of give a, a little bit of a summary, some things he's done. And I'm not going to get lost in the weeds with this part, because I, I want us to see not where he's, go- where he's going through, but where he's getting to. But he starts off, he says, finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write this again is no trouble to me, and it's a safeguard for you. A good side note, good pastor verse right there. Sometimes you feel like, oh, I've already said this before. But sometimes the reminder is good, right? It's good for you, and it's a safeguard, right? Uh, it's good, no trouble to me, and it's a safeguard for you. I love to say it again and again because it points to Jesus. He says, beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of those who mutilate the flesh. Basically, what he's talking about here, in their time, in, Christ, in his time, there were those who were Jews coming out, right? Jesus was a Jewish Messiah following the law. They were getting circumcised growing up in that, and there was nothing wrong with that. But there were those who were saying to p- people in Christ, saying, you must now be circumcised in order to be in the faith. And Paul calls them, what? Dogs, mutilators of the flesh. I mean, in other words, I mean, he's saying they just basically cut off that part and they mutilate themselves. There's nothing in it, he's saying, that's going to be salvific. He says, but we are the true circumcision, the ones who worship by the Spirit of God, we exalt in Christ Jesus, and do not rely on on human credentials. In other words, he's saying, it's not about what we do. Salvation is not based on what we have accomplished, what we do, what we don't do, but it's based in something else. It's based in what we looked at last week, Jesus who would give up all that he might bring all. And so Paul is going to give us just quick review, and then he's going to go through a little bit of a credentials here. He says, you know, that, that we don't you know, we worship, we don't rely on human credentials, though he says mine, too, are significant. And he's not going to lie. He says, hey, listen, if anybody has something to say, if anybody has something to stand on, my credentials, he's saying, are pretty significant. He goes, if someone thinks he has good reason to put confidence in human credentials, in other words, it says in the flesh, I have more. He's like, it doesn't matter who you are, you want to line up here, and we're going to go, who's the most, you know, following after the law and doing all the credentials? He's like, I'm at the front of the line. He's like, I'm going to let you know that you're not better than me when it comes to these things. But watch his attitude. He goes through a few things. He says, here it is. I was circumcised on the eighth day. My parents, I was born in. I was already eight days in. I'm already doing exactly as the law says. I'm, I, like, from day eight, day eight days in, I'm it. My parents are doing the right thing. I was raised up in a good, believing family, right? Not only that, he says, from the people of Israel. I came from the right people group. Not only that, I was, you know, on the tribe of Benjamin. At that time, Benjamin was seen at the time of Paul. It was, probably, it was one of the more highly high, you know, highlighted people. They hadn't lost their identity in the exile, things like that. They were seen. Many of the Pharisees, many of the religious leaders came from this tribe. They were seen, even though they were the smallest to be the greatest. He said, so I was born into everything. All the privilege you could want, I was born fully into it. Not only that, he says, so I can't just go off of what I was born into, but look at this. He says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. This is Paul's, basically, he said, if there's a Hebrew, I out-Hebrewed every other Hebrew, okay? This is Paul, Paul going, you know what? I graduated. I went to Princeton University, top of my class at Princeton University. I graduated number one at Ivy League at the number one school. If there's anybody that wants to say better, I am better than the best. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. But he says not only that, he says, I lived according to the laws of Pharisee. I didn't just graduate from Princeton, number one in my class. I went to Harvard Law and graduated number one there, and got my JD, you know, JD there as well. You want to talk about credentials, I'm it. I've done it. Nobody's done it better. I am as about as skilled and as, as knowledgeable as they come. This guy lived in privilege. This guy did it all, worked his butt off, and did everything. Not only that, in my zeal for, zeal for God, he said, I persecuted the church. There were these people coming in and disrupting our 2,000-year religion, trying to say that this Messiah, this guy, was the, the true Messiah. And, I, and he's like, I knew for a fact that he wasn't. And if they're going to try to lead people astray, I persecuted them. I stopped them because I knew the law better than anybody else, and I'm going to make sure they stop. I'm going to protect my sheep from the wolves, right? 
And he says, lastly, according to the righteousness stipulated by the law, I was blameless. In other words, it's kind of like the, you know, the, the big thing now, right, is you got to watch yourself. You know, if, if you, you could be lily white, right, you could be white as a sheep, but what's going to happen? People are going to go into your Instagram, under your Twitter, to your Facebook, and where do they look? They don't look like in the last six months when you've been running for office. Where do they look at? What you wrote like 15 years ago, you know? And they're going to get you the gotcha, right? They're going to get you. But Paul says, you know what? Go look at my Instagram. Look at my Twitter. Look at my Facebook feed. I don't care. You're not going to find anything. I am blameless. There is nothing you can bring against me. This guy is the guy. This is the guy you want running things. He's the top of his class, the best of the best. This is the guy you want it. You want leading things. He's got it all. Born into privilege, worked his way up, done it. All of the things in life, he sounds a lot like who in Ecclesiastes? Solomon. If there was a thing to be built, I built it. If there was a privilege to be done, I did it. If there was something to be experienced, I experienced it. If there was something to be bought, I bought it. Doesn't matter what it is, I have done it. I've experienced it all. He says, all of the things in this world that you could possibly grasp for, I've done what? I've got them. I held them all right here. I've got them. All of the things that could be grasped for, I'm holding on to them all. And that's exactly where many of us want to be, right? We want to attain. We want to get there. And if it isn't for us, we want it for our kids, don't we? We want them. I didn't get a college education. I didn't get this. I want my kids to grow up better than me. I don't want them to have it, right? We all want it. We all want something out here that we grasp for. Paul says, I grasped them all. I had them all in my hands. But look at this. Look at what he says. But. Not what you would expect, but. These assets I have come to regard as what? Liabilities. Now, I think it's interesting. This, is the, this word here, in some versions, anybody have a version that says something def- different? Lost, okay? A lot of versions say lost. And I think this is, a, like, this is one of those words that when we say lost, it's not necessarily a wrong word. But I think it's a word that whenever you think of lost, I want to ask you, like, when you think of Paul says... These things I counted as lost. What do you think of? What comes to mind? They were maybe taken away. They weren't any good. Garbage. Not an asset. Maybe let them go, right? Hey, I let all these things go. I count them as lost. Say, hey, pfft, they're gone. But I think that's true, and we're going to see that, but I think it, it devalues. Now, let me ask you this a little bit. When you see the word liability, and that's why I think this is a better word, translation for this word, liability. Loss can be, I just let it go. But what's a liability? It's a weight, what'd you say? It counts against you. There's a responsibility, a burden. What is Paul saying about all of the things in the world that you could possibly want and grasp them and hold on to them? He doesn't say, I just let them go. He says, if I hold on to these things, They will not just be not worth anything, but they do what to me? They weigh me down. In my pursuit of Christ, remember that backpack we looked at quite a few weeks ago? In my pursuit of Christ, all of those things that I grasp for in this life, they are nothing more than a liability. They will not just merely keep you from getting better. They will be a detriment in your life. That's a big difference. He says, everything that I could count as gain was a liability to me. The things that we grasp for will take from us. They will never give life. They will merely take. And I can tell, and I, can't, I can't prove that to you except for go out and start grasping, and I guarantee you, you will come back at some point and you will say, yes, this was futile because it will never satisfy. These liabilities, he said, all the things that I gained, they're liabilities. It sounds a lot like what? Hevel. All of the things that you grasp for ultimately, as Paul says, Hevel. 
All of those things, he said, the liabilities, why? Because, here's the key, because of Christ. But more than that, I now regard not just the things that I gained, not just all the credentials, but I count all things. How many things? All things as what? Liabilities. Well, but he does, surely doesn't mean this, right? Surely he doesn't mean a degree. Surely he doesn't mean money. Surely he doesn't mean security. Surely he doesn't mean whatever it may be. Surely he doesn't mean getting a house. Surely he doesn't mean having a, you know, plenty of kids. Surely it doesn't mean having kids that raise up in earth wisdom. Surely it doesn't mean, right? We have all of the things, all of the excuses, all of the things we say, surely it's not this, and then we will find something that will go and grasp after it, thinking that surely Paul didn't mean all things when he said all things. I don't see a disclaimer. All things are liabilities will weigh you down compared to the love of its far greater value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Indeed, I love it. He says, I, he says, for whom I have suffered, here it is, the loss of all things. They're liabilities, but he also says, all of those things, what did I do? I suffered loss. They all went away. What did those same Jews that he, they were cheering him on, holding, he, when he was holding the coats when they were stoning Stephen, now when he came to Christ, what were they wanting to do? To stone him. All of those credentials meant jack and squat in following Christ. But I love this. I lost of all things. Indeed, I regard them as what? Dung. And, you know, it's interesting. We see, we see this word dung, and, you know, but this word, scubalon, it's a funny word. It's funny for us, scubalon. But it's, uh, this word was actually a very vulgar word in Greek. It's what you would think of as our vulgar word in English for dung. You don't want to say it. Nobody, don't worry about it. Use your imagination. <laughs> but Paul says, now interestingly, how did he start off this chapter? Talking about people that put their, their confidence in the flesh. Javen, when you eat something, what does your flesh produce within, you know, time? Scubalon. It does. Thank you. Scubalon. What does the flesh produce? Scubalon. It produces dung. He says, everything that I grasp for, all it turns into is that. And I had a pastor that would, want, uh, would tell us, he said, you can take a turd and you can polish it up. You can dip it in gold. You can put it on the mantle. You can shine it up and put a plaque with it. But in the end, it's still a turd. You don't polish a turd. But that's what we do in our lives. We go out and find the things that, that just are dung, and we polish them up and think that they are going to give us significance. And Paul says, that is the wrong thing to pursue. Why? I regard them as dung, and this is it, this is it, that I, I suffer the loss of all things and count them as dung, so why? That I may gain Christ. This is the goal. Losing everything in this life equates with gaining Jesus I don't know about you, but it's kind of an unfair deal on the part of Christ, right? He gets our sin, and we get eternal life. I don't know about you, but I'll take that deal any day. The odds are very much in our favor in that one. I'll take it. But Paul goes on further. He says in verse 9, And not just to gain Christ, but to be found in Him, not because I have my own righteousness derived from the law, not because I've done the right things, not because I've, I've gone to the right church services, not because of I, you know, all the things that I could say, look, I, I'm blameless. He said, I'm blameless in the law. That's not where my righteousness comes from. But because I have the righteousness that comes by the way of Christ's faithfulness. 
Faithfulness to who? To his father. Faithfulness to be obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. A righteousness from God that is in fact based on Christ's faithfulness. That is where righteousness comes from. And it is the gift of the gospel for us. This is his obedience in his non-grasping. And Paul says, my aim is to know Jesus. My aim is to know Jesus. How much so? I want to experience the power of his resurrection. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead, he says, now lives in you. Do you want that power? I would love to know that power. I want to share in the sufferings. Well, hold up a second, Paul. We're going a little fast on that one. Slow down a little bit. Not Maybe not so much. I don't want to share in his sufferings maybe as much. But not only that, I want to be like him in his death. Whoa. But let me ask you a question. If you want to know Jesus, you can you know Jesus fully if you only know him and understand him in his exaltation in the good times? What are you missing in knowing Jesus? All of the humility, all of the making himself nothing, all of the people that turned their back and rejected him, the suffering that he paid for, the death that he, that he died. Paul says, I want to know him so much, and if it means that I suffer to be like him, if it means that I have to die to be like him, then I want it because there is nothing else that will matter more than knowing Jesus. And he says, and somehow, knowing that, to attain the resurrection from the dead. He says, I want to be like him in his death so that I might become like him in the newness of life one day. And we're not even done yet. Paul's like, I'm just getting started. Verse 12. But look here, not that I have already attained it. Right? I haven't gotten there yet, nor have I become perfect. Before we think, maybe Paul has made it, anybody has made it, he said, I'm not there yet. The guy who wrote 13 books of the New Testament is not there yet. I haven't already been perfected, but I love this. Look at this. Here's Ecclesiastes. But I strive to what? Lay hold. The Greek here is the word to seize, to overtake something, to catch it. Like it's going out in front of us and it's, I'm coming to seize the thing that is out in front of me. What is Paul saying? I want to grasp after and lay hold of something. What? That, for that which Christ Jesus, look at this. What did we see last week in chapter 2? Christ Jesus, did he grasp? No, but he did Grasp for one thing. And what is that? You and me. I want to grasp, to seize, to overtake the very thing that Christ Jesus laid hold of me, he said. Striving to lay hold of the thing that he held up. Look at this in Romans chapter 8. What is that thing he laid hold of? 829. Listen to this. Because those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. That his Son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. God chose Paul, as he does all believers, what? To make Paul and to make you and to make me like Jesus. The goal of our salvation is that we may lay hold of the glory of Jesus. What an amazing God that he would desire to share the glory of his son with us. The same glory given to Jesus he wants to give to us. And Paul's lifelong goal, he says, is to pursue Jesus. This was the goal in saving him, and it's the goal for us. But Paul says, I'm not done yet. 
Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have attained this yet. He said, I haven't gotten there. I'm stretching out and reaching out, but I haven't attained it yet. I love this. Instead, I am single-minded. I love, uh, I think the New American Standard says it, there is but one thing that I do. One thing that I do, Paul says. My life is about this one thing. It is forgetting what is behind and striving ahead for what? What is ahead? Reaching out for the things that are ahead. As Paul is running his race in life, he is reaching out for something. To grasp the only thing that matters. With this goal in mind, I strive towards the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says, everything I do, one thing I do is I reach out. For the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. And I think this goal will be realized fully and only fully grasped when we are reunited, reunited in the presence of Jesus, our Savior. When we will experience the power of the resurrection one day in Christ, if we are followers of Him. I want to say as believer. Those of you who follow Christ, nothing else will satisfy. Those of you that here that do not follow Christ, nothing else will satisfy in your grasping. Nothing will bring you purpose in your pursuits. Nothing will cure the hevel in this life. Nothing will cure you for your futility. Except for a striving for and reaching out to grasp Jesus. The one who reaches out to grasp us. And Paul finishes in 15 and 16. He says, therefore, let it, those who are perfect. I think he's being a little like those who think, oh, you can reach perfection. He's being a little sarcastic. Embrace this point of view. What? That we haven't made it. That we're still straining. God will reveal you the error of your ways. Nevertheless, I love this. Let us live up to the standard that we all Ready, have, attained. Paul encourages us in our pursuit. Live up to a standard. Those, who you, those that want to say, you got Jesus, just that's all you need. Paul would go disagree with you. Live up to the standard. When you understand, if you know what Jesus has done to grasp for us, it should be all of our pursuits to live in light of that. It should matter how we live when I understand what Christ has laid hold of me. I should respond in kind and live to that standard. Why? Because of the joy that's found there. And I just want to finish with this. I'm going to, I'm going to wrap this up. How can we do this? I'm going to give you four, I think, divine resources to pursue. Knowing that the Holy Spirit, that same power that raised Christ from the dead, is working in, not me, working in us to be what he's called us to this standard. And I think it's four things. I'm going to go through these very quickly. But I think one, first is he gives us the word of God. First Peter 2, 2 says that you should, that we should all what? Long for the word of God like a newborn baby that longs for the milk. A newborn, the, basically the only thing they think about, they're single-minded, about what? Eating. Long for the spiritual milk, which is the word of God, so that you might grow up into maturity. We've been given the word of God, 1 Peter 2.2. 2. Second, we've been given prayer. We've been given prayer. I love 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 9. Paul's pray, prayer <clears throat> for them, for the church. He says, for we rejoice whenever we are weak, but you are strong. And we pray for this, that you may become fully qualified. Paul says, we pray for one another that we might grow up to look more like who? Jesus. 
This is the end goal in mind. This is the telos, is to look like Jesus. Third, we've been given godly examples, following godly examples. Paul says it many times, 1 Corinthians 4, he says it, 16, he says, imitate who? Me. Paul says, imitate me. Look like me. Well, that's too arrogant, Paul. But he doesn't finish with imitate me. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. I'm trying to look like Jesus. Look like me. I would love for every one of us in here to be able to say that. And, and not the false humility of like, ah, uh, I'm just never good enough. Yeah, we might be. You might not be good enough. But we're striving forward to Christ. Has Paul made it? No. What's he doing? Reaching out. That's what we're imitating, reaching out for Christ and saying, come along and let's do this together. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. What did Christ do? He reached out and grasped for others. What are we to do? Reach out and grasp for each other. He says, imitate one another in other places. But fourth, as he gives us trials, trials to mold us into the image of Jesus. Right, James chapter 2, a lot of you probably could quote this verse. James chapter, uh, sorry, 1 verse, uh, sorry, James 1 verse 2. Listen to this. My brothers and sisters, consider it nothing but joy when you fall into all sorts of trials. Hmm. Why? Because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. So you can keep running. And the endurance have its perfect effect, so that you will be perfect and complete, not deficient in anything. James is saying the trials that we go through in this life, the things that are tough, the things that we don't like, bring us endurance so that we might be made perfect, that we may be made like Christ. First Peter 5 says the same thing. But this is to be our pursuit. This is to be the one thing that we grasp for because nothing else matters. Everything else is hevel. Everything else is dung. I want us to want more Jesus. You know, at the the foot of the Swiss Alps, there's a, excuse me, there's a marker of a, that's down at one of the, the Alps, Swiss Alps in a mountain and it basically, there's a, there's a marker there, and it's talking about the death of a climber. And it, the only thing that's on the marker, it says his name, and underneath it says this simply, just a simple epitaph. It says this, he died climbing. He died climbing. I believe the epitaph of every follower of Christ should be that they died climbing the upward path towards the prize of Christ's likeness. May it be said of us that when we died, they died climbing after Jesus. I'd be all right with that being on my headstone. He died climbing. And let us live our life, I love, I'm going to finish with this, like Paul says in chapter 1 of Philippians 1.21, he says, for me to live is what? Christ. It's interesting. In the Greek, it just says, for me, living, Christ. There's no it. It's just living, Christ. In other words, living is equal to Christ. And he says, death, gain. Living is Christ and death. The ultimate enemy is that Solomon faced, that he did not know how to overcome, death is Christ. Death is gain. Why? Because I get to be with my sweet Savior. And one day, I will no longer fear death, because he will raise us all up into newness of life, into resurrected bodies, and heaven will come down upon earth in the new Jerusalem, and Jesus will be with us on the new earth. And forever and ever and ever, we get to be in the presence of our God, and he will share the glory that belongs to the Son with the sons of glory. And we will get to forever worship and be with him. But in the meantime, living is Christ. Amen.
Let us get busy living for Christ with death in mind, because death is gain. Amen? Let's pray.